challenge. Okay. <laughs> Always a challenge, just because it's. Uh, here, let me bring Texas back in here. But how how was that during during the COVID situation? Like, how did you guys even pull that off? We it you had to do certain things. Texas, are you with us again? Are you with us? He's there, but he's frozen again. Yeah, I think he's going through a, a weird area. Hopefully he can. But um, we had to have everybody in the cast and crew checked. Everybody had to be checked for coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Go into the hospital. I had to take all the actors in and all the crew in yeah. the hospital, have them checked and certified that they were clean and all this stuff. It's a bunch of bullshit. Trust me, man. I'm not. I'm not looking for. I mean, we've been shut down on production on Dorner since uh, March, and like we're planning on getting back into filming probably the. We're hoping right now January, but just of all the protocol stuff that they're like telling us what we got to go through, what we got to do, it's just like it's been a mission, man. Like I, for I mean, I say for like for example for. Shows like Bold and the Beautiful and, and Y&R, it's a lot easier for them just because of the close shooting aspect and it being in an actual studio and yeah. limited cast. And it's not where you guys are shooting outdoors, but when you're trying to shoot in an action show, like an action series television show, this is sure. where we're trying to like figure out, like, okay, like, how are we doing this? Because, I mean, we have a – I mean, if any of you guys are familiar with the Christopher Dorner story, if you don't, look it up, Google it. We're trying to figure out, like, we've got heavy, heavy, heavy action scenes in the last, like, two, three episodes. And we haven't even shot that stuff yet. And trying to figure out, like, how we're going to do this is it, just, it, right now, it's pretty mind-boggling for me on even, even trying to think about it. And just yeah, the fact yeah. of all the protocols. And so that's why I'm, like, curious on how you guys were able to pull it off in Italy, which was a, a high rate of covid in the early stages, I mean, you've been out there for a while. So, how, I mean, what was the, the adjustment for you guys, like for you as an actor, trying to navigate through this new world of filming in COVID-19 era? Well, D, I, I, uh, I don't know if, how you feel about the, the political aspect of the COVID and all that, but I, oh, happen, bullshit. I happen to know that it's complete bullshit what you just yep. said. And but everybody is treating it like it's viable and it's a real horrendous pandemic and all. So when you when you're dealing with legalities of stuff, we have to go mm -hmm. through certain protocols as well. And we did that. We did that to the best of our ability here in Italy because they were yes, they were hit. Uh, they were presumably hit very hard. And they said it was much worse than it was. People in Italy are finding out that it was not the way they said up to do. So that's good. But we still have to go through all the protocols. So we had everybody tested every two weeks. And we did all that stuff. D, let Lost me ask you quick. Yep. Can you can you turn your phone on the uh, uh, what do you call it? Landscape mode? Let me see if it changes for you. Would that work for you? Just switch it landscape. Go on. Mm. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Mm. Hold on. Perfect. I think I turned the volume down. Mm. Yeah, that's good. It, it's a better look when it's in the uh, landscape mode. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You still hear me the same way? Yeah, hold on. I'm just trying to straighten it out on my end here. So I'm not looking crooked. Mm. Better? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Yeah. Okay. And you can just... Uh, I, think we lo I think we lost Texas again. Yeah, he's going through a, a weird connection area, but hopefully he'll log in again. No, like, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, for me, I, I, I don't know if you knew when I was traveling with Catherine Kelly Lang and Greg Ricard, we did an appearance um, back in December out in Canada. And I ended up getting COVID literally like right after we came back, I was laid out for two months 
Um, Greg ended up getting it probably about three weeks later. And which is the I- ironic part about it is that, like, I was with Catherine way more of the trip than I was with Greg. And I always say she's like Superwoman. Like, it, I feel that if it wasn't for her never ending marathon running, triathlon stuff, and all her health. So that's why I tell people, I said, you know what, like, the virus, 100% real because that shit was one of the worst things I've ever experienced in my life. But the scamdemic 2020 to me, it's, 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 it's gotten to the point now that it's, it's like, we're talking about mass. We're talking about lockdowns. We're talking about this, but there's been no talk about what we're actually doing to move forward. And I say to people, number one, the only way that this shit ends where things go back to, I wouldn't say normal, but go back to a situation where we're not living in this whatever crazy world we're living in right now, is if we just stop talking about it. Like, we just go about your lives, and you do what you were doing before, because, as I've said before to people, if the media never told you to be afraid, you wouldn't be afraid. If the media didn't tell you that this virus was so deathly, you'd be going about your business as you would be every day. Absolutely. But right now, it's like when everyone's at home, glued to their television, glued to their phones, glued to whatever area that they look for their social feeds, it's constant. I mean, literally, you turn on the news, if it's not coronavirus on the news, it's Trump. If it's not Trump, it's Biden. If it's not Biden, it's Hillary. It's the same situation going around in a circle and it's like to me people number one are feeding into this whole you know i'm for mask i'm not against mask and i'm my whole point is at the end of the day there's one thing that we all have universally as human beings that will never ever ever change we all die and we only get one life and it's like i i i take prowess in the sense of after christoph died that Life is so short, and you only have one opportunity to live out your best life. So whether you're for a mask, whether you're against a mask, who gives a shit? Just do you, take care of the people that you love, live your life, and focus on things that you know make you happy. I, I always say, though, 2020 is a year that needed to happen. Because if you look at the way that the world's been going in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years in this fast pace of things just constantly happening, constantly happening. But I say to people, like, you know what, 2020 is a year. What, is, what does 2020 mean to you? What's the definition of 2020? Clear vision. When you think of 2020, you think of clear vision. And I tell people it's a time for people to open their eyes, to see what's going on around them, to see what's in front of them, see what you're, what you're for, what you're against, but most importantly, figure out for yourself the life that you're living is it what you want to be living right now. Do things you've never done before. Try things you've never tried before. Experience things that you've always wanted to do, but we always sit there and say, well, I'm busy. It's like when people say, for example, sure to you, you have people in your life and you have a busy life. I got a busy life. Everybody's got a busy life. But when we, we met, we saw each other last at a funeral where everybody's gathering together for Kristoff to show that love. And people always said the same thing at funerals. I wish I had more time. I wish I had more time with the person that I love. But I always tell people, you have time. You just have to prioritize what's important to you. That's why for me, like, Kristoff was my lifeline in so many ways as a brother as somebody that pulled me out of some of the, the darkest moments in my life. And to me, if I take anything that he used to say to me that I try to pass on the people is that, you know what, make the most of the life that you got, not the life that you wish you have, but the life that you have, because we didn't think Corona. I mean, a year ago, we, we would never have thought something like coronavirus would have completely just came and destroyed the world the way that it has. 
D, what, what you're saying only... is really, really important, and I want you to continue. Can you can you tilt your phone a little bit? Because all we're seeing is the Celtics shirt. If you, I want people to be able to see you while you're. Okay, can you see me now. You're, you know, you're still your 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 head's oh, still no. cut off. There you go. That's better. There. Yeah. Better. Okay. Even a little more. Even a little more. I want people because what you're saying is so important and it's very true. Of 2020, I think I'm hoping that 2020 is a year where people have more introspection and are able to to enjoy their life more. Yeah, if tilted just a little bit more, a little bit more, so that your whole head is in there. Is that possible? You see me now? It's still kind of the same. It hasn't changed. Hold on. Let me try to lift it up. Hold on a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. He just uh, disengaged himself. I've lost both my subjects here. <laughs> God. I know that uh, Texas has probably gone through a horrible cellular section with the airport. He's traveling. Uh, he's got to travel about two hours, apparently, to go to the airport from what he said before we started. But uh, well, I'm seeing you guys' messages, and they're right on. And I didn't see who who said that the uh, – let me bring D back in. Hold on. There we go. Now uh, turn mm. sideways. There we go. Oh, you're still uh, – Hopefully it will transfer over sideways. There you go. Somebody said the, the virus is very real. Yes, the virus was and is real. But the media, the bull, when we talk about the bullshit part of it, is the media's reaction and the media hype of it. Um, we've had flus and things before we have flus every year and we've never had the world shut down because of a flu. And now the media has made the world shut down and has put fear into people. That's what D was talking about. Um, there's such fear involved with the masks and the constant People, telling people have died every day, hundreds and thousands of people dying every day when they are not. They are not dying in the numbers that they're giving. And that's, uh, that's something well, this that... This is the thing. The no yeah, keep going. Because you're, what this you're is, saying was very the important. The, the, when you talk about the numbers and the sense, and I mean, I, I personally even hate even talking about this in general, but like from day one, these numbers everywhere you hear, this place is going up. That place is going up. This place is going up. There has not been, hold on. Mm, mm, mm. There we go. There has not been one. Can you see me? Go back. Or am I dropping? Not yet. Your head's still gone here. Fuck Keeps sakes. changing. Thing is like, okay. Better? Let's, let's stay there. Okay. Yeah, what I was saying, when you talk about these numbers, the only person that's been talking about these numbers from day one have been politicians. You have not heard one, you have not heard one medical, real medical professional go up there and say, okay, this has happened. And, and for someone that was there in the hospital seeing what was going on, I can tell you firsthand that people, number one, that were coming in there when I was there, I was there for two months. It didn't matter whether you had a cold, didn't matter whether you were sick with a with anything. COVID-19. COVID-19. Why? All these hospitals are privately funded. They're not run by the government. They're all privately funded by boards, doctors, private private funders. So when there's any bit of a pandemic, doesn't matter whether it's SARS or you know, the swine flu, any of the major pandemics that have came out over the last several years. When you have 
any bit of a pandemic in that situation. In order for a hospital to get funding, real funding, they've got to raise their numbers in a pandemic. So when a pandemic happens, whatever hospital has the highest numbers is the hospital that's getting the budget. So that's why when you see the certain areas that you, even for example, in New York City, you have certain hospitals over here that were, that were higher cases and other smaller areas where people where they say people were more dying was because of the simple fact was when you're scrolling through your social media feeds, Every day, seeing COVID-19 numbers, numbers, numbers. What are people doing? They're not actually clicking and actually reading the article. They're just clicking the share button and sharing it, sharing it, sharing it, sharing it, sharing it. So when you talk about the media spreading the scamdemic, you got to think of it this way. The media cares more about putting shit out first than putting shit out accurately. And us as entertainers who are in this business, I know you know this, Ron, as well, like, they always love a good story. They're, they're never about promoting or putting out the positive, the positive spin on something. It's always the shock and awe that's going to get people to click and sure. read. Of so when you have a, a, a story, for example, a guy who has, like for me, I have underlying conditions myself. So I'm more, I'm more at risk and more, more affected by a pandemic like this because of other things that I've dealt with health-wise. But when you see, for example, a story of John 15 or John 50, 52 dies of coronavirus, most people won't even actually click on the article. They'll just share it. But if they actually clicked on the article and actually read the article, you would see that John from Missouri has heart condition, some other, vi- some other illness that he was dealing with. But at the end of the day, what's going to sell more papers? What's going to sell more media press? John 52 from Missouri dies of heart failure or John 52 dies of coronavirus? That's what you're going to be paying attention to. The guy who's and, died of coronavirus. And the, and then they continue and the coronavirus, the, the hospital will get more money if they list coronavirus. Exactly. So and this is, and had, this, is what, this is what's... We had friends that uh, lost an elderly parent... And the hospital actually lost the elderly parent because of a heart attack or some other condition. And the hospital actually came to them and said, we will pay for your father's funeral if you let us put coronavirus as the cause of death. Mm -hmm. And that's been going on in mass, in mass, because they'll get a massive amount of money if it's coronavirus as opposed to another condition of some sort. And so the numbers have just skyrocketed because of that. Uh, D, somebody, uh, Brian, let me put this on. I don't want, it's going to obscure your face for a second, but I want, he asked, can D describe the symptoms he had? Because I had shortness of breath issues from October 2019 to February 2020. But people were curious what symptoms and what it felt like for you to go through that. <laughs> All I can say was that, hold on, this damn fucking thing, hold on. It won't stay there? It won't stay in what, you can't lean it, it up just, against it, something? It, yeah, hold on. Sometimes if you put it, a little it, it something. It stays when I put it this way, but hold on. Oh, okay. Sometimes you have to just put a little something underneath the bottom of it just to hold it there. Because what you're saying is so important. I want people to be able to actually see you speaking and all. Can you see me now? Yeah, if you could, if you could just come down just a little bit so that your, your head's more towards the top third of the screen. I don't, you, even, yeah. I don't even see myself now. Hold on. Oh, you don't. There? No, okay, now I do. Yeah, you're good there. That's okay, good. Okay. That's good. Good. Uh, cool. Um, cool. Cool. So what what did you what were you feeling when you actually went through this? The best way that I can describe it to people when people I mean I'm actually I've actually been writing a, a fifty day because I was fifty days that I was laid out. And I've actually been writing from my blog. Like every day, like uh, I, had, I had written like everything that I had gone through from day one. And, and when I, you know, when I first started feeling it, 
But the easiest way that I can describe for anybody the pain that it was, it was like having, if anyone's familiar with the back in the day of WWF, Yokozuna what is and that? King Kong Bundy sitting. He was a wrestler. Okay. He weighed over 500 pounds. Oh, so it literally, yeah. it felt like you had a 500-pound person on your chest, wow. on your back. Because literally for me, the energy to even brush my teeth, get up and go to the bathroom. It was like I ran a marathon. I had literally zero energy. Um, went from my from breathing aspects of barely being able to feel like I was breathing. Like it just, it was crushing my lungs on every aspect of, it was so hard where I eventually had to go on a ventilator because I was like, I couldn't breathe. And then um, headaches, uh, paranoia, uh, I started to basically get a little bit delusional after like the the fifteenth day. I actually started like seeing things like, and I, and again that was a was a heavy time for me emotionally. Just of course, you know, still reeling over the loss of Kristoff. So I started. I mean, legitimately, I was seeing things like it was they were like real, you know, that hallucination that they say. Okay. Um, a lot of pain throughout my body, aches, headaches. Um, Everything you could think of, man. It, 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 as I said, I, I don't wish, I don't wish that thing on anybody. Like anybody, number one that has gotten it full blown, they'll tell you it. It sucks the life right out of you. Like it's not like it's like because even when I first went in, they had diagnosed it first because it was in the early stages. It wasn't um, the worldwide COVID nineteen thing yet because I got it fairly early before it went media wide. And it went media-wide mainly because of the fact was that when that cruise ship that was stuck somewhere out on sea, some Canadians were on it, some Americans were on it. And of course, you know, anything that's on Canadian television is com smaller to American television because there's so many more networks in America. So if something happens with a Canadian, per se, who's on board or something, People are like, why is, this, why is this boat being trapped out to sea for 37 days? We don't know why the street. And then eventually the U.S. media picked it up and then it went viral. And then so when I first went in, they were like, it's uh, pneumonia. And I was like, I've had fucking pneumonia before. This was no pneumonia. Like this was something worse because my fever the first week, which was the day that I was with Catherine, um, it's probably about like maybe about a, 101. And I was, and I thought that was just due to the fact of we had been going, doing press, and doing the event for like four days. So I, I, I didn't sleep. I didn't. I, I, I was traveling on no sleep whatsoever. So I just, you know, figured it was exhaustion. I didn't know what it was because I mean, again, I didn't know what COVID nineteen was or coronavirus. And then, probably into like the third or fourth day, it just my fever kept going up. And going up and going up. Then I went into the hospital. They checked me in. They were like, you know, you're really low hydrated. So they put me on an IV drip, got some fluids back into my system. And then they sent me home. Two days later, I was like sweating, like sweating, like so, so much that it felt like I was shedding pounds how much I was sweating. And then, and you go from like uh, one minute, you're like, high fever where you're sweating to next minute you're you're shaking you're cold like chills at nighttime and then eventually after that it just the breathing started you started making it worse like walking getting up the stairs to do anything was it was really really tightening and as i said for me i've dealt with health situations in my past so for me it's going to be a lot worse for someone like me what were your Someone issues that, before? Like, for example, said, you, like, you had some pre pre existing conditions or something. Yeah, I was I got stabbed in in uh, ninety eight in a street fight, and it messed up my insides pretty badly. So wow. I've always had issues from because of that. But the thing went for me was it was like okay, I'm like I'm pretty active at not as much as I used to be, but as I said, it was really weird for me going. Like, Catherine, after that trip, I called her, and I'm like, are you okay? And she's like, I'm, she's like, yeah, I'm a little bit run down, but I'm fine. And her, 
I think, as I said, being in the excellent condition that she always is in. Because you know how much she's always doing things, always running marathons and on the bike with Dom and et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, okay. Then Greg ended up announcing that he got sick. And I was like, okay. I think it really boils down to on how well you take care of your body prior to this whole situation. If you're an active person, you're probably going to bounce back a lot quicker. Me, I'm not that active as I used to. Plus the underlying conditions, it made my situation a lot worse. So all I tell people, number one, with the situation is that do your diligence when you're out. If you're going to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you're, if you're, when they say six feet, like for me, do I always wear a mask? No. If I go into a private store and that store says you have to come in here with a mask on, don't be a douchebag. It's their private store. Respect it. Come in there, get what you need, and get out. If you're social distancing, understand. I was already social distancing before it was a hashtag. Just because for me, I'm a private person in my personal life. So I'm not around a lot of people to begin with. But even when I'm out, I'm trying to, which is what's mind-boggling to me, the, the nonsense that from the get-go. Keep your distance. Wash your hands. Ask yourself this question. If someone needs to tell you to wash your hands before this pandemic, then you seriously have some issues. Because I don't know any person who doesn't wash their hands in general. If you're out in a public setting, if somebody was this close in my face and I don't know them, there'd be a problem. <laughs> because, again, why would you be coming that close in general to somebody in the get-go? So you're already going to be six feet. Normal people would be going about their business six feet. If, if I walked up to Ron and got up on your face, I didn't know you'd be like, yo, dude, why are you, why are you up in my face? And, and, and what this whole thing is about, even the lockdown, the lockdown's not about numbers because we understand we've done that. We've been in lockdown since March. We've did this thing for now six months and it hasn't shown any major difference other than the economy taking a hit and people, number one, doing what they do, being puppets. Because understand, it's just like, for example, we're in this, this divide right now in the country. Trumpers, non-Trumpers. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who's sitting in that office. It doesn't matter who's sitting in that chair. The people that are in power don't make the rules. The legislation of the laws, that's what makes the rules. These are people that are put in front of our faces every single day to basically tell us, do this and do that. And if you find in society, majority of people, number one, what I like to say we have a lot of sheep mentality, not a lot of lion mentality in the sense of wolves because more people will rather be told what to do than be put in the position of power to have that responsibility to have all that weight on the show. It's like for you being a lead actor when you were on B&B driving that show. It's a lot of pressure. If you drop the ball, the rest of the show falls. If you're, a lead, if you're in a lead movie and you're the lead actor of the, of, of the film, or you're the director of the film. It's your job to lead everything forward. But most people don't want that responsibility. That's why you see most actors in the early stages, and when we first started in this game, you could just be actors. Now the game has changed. You got to be actors, directors, producers to have longevity in your career because the business, it changes all the time. The same way with power. It changes all the time. You could put Trump. You could put Obama. You could put Reagan. You could put Hillary. You could put whoever in that chair. It doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, we as the people, we decide really in reality our lives. Because at the end of the day, you got to ask yourself, even for you living on this earth, Ron, as long as you have, whether you vote, whether you don't vote, for every situation that you've been in your life, every bad situation. So, for example, we were both at Christoph's funeral. Was the president at Christoph's funeral? Was he? 
The president of the United States? Was he at Christoph's funeral? I didn't see him. Did you? No, because he wasn't there. No. If, when, when, you, when you got your first job at B&B, was that a result of your hard work and your talent, or was it with the result of a president? It was a result of your hard work and your talent. Everything that happens in life, in the sense, number one, that I have gone through, it has never been anything to do with who's in power. That's why I don't get involved in politics. I don't care what they do because at the end of the day, it doesn't affect my life. I am still going to go out there and do what I have to do to live my life. And that's what people need to start doing in order for this shit to end. To go I, out there and stop living your life, stop going on social media and bickering and fighting and battling of this and that because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at the end of the day. We all die. We all only have one life. I think what you're saying about, you mentioned before, this year, 2020, being so important. And I think that's an important message of people just spending the time to enjoy your life and have a happy life. Get mm -hmm. off social media uh, a little bit each day. Don't be obsessed with it. And for me, my main message would be stop listening to the mainstream media. They're making the world crazy with the, the messages and the hate and the stuff that, mm -hmm. that they're promoting. Uh, I want to say this to everybody that's li listening. I don't feel like we have an, a, an issue, a pandemic of racism in the United States. I don't feel we have that at all. I don't know any friends that are racist. I don't know any friends that were racist. I, I, I haven't lived a life of that at all. I have friends of all different persuasions of everything, including genders and all, and we're all getting along great. But the news See, constantly promotes the... They want us to be separated by, by uh, gender and identity politics. And I don't believe that's actually going on with the world. But the news keeps hammering us with this information to the point where people are getting crazy. And people are thinking, we have a real racist problem in the United States. Maybe people there are circumstances that happen. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a pandemic of it. I think most people get along great, but you don't hear about the people getting along great. You hear about the stuff that, you know, the couple of problems that happen, like the, the couple of the one building that's burning in the city. That's what the news is going to show you. And it makes it look like the whole city is on fire. The one incident that happens, they're going to show you that one. When the 99 and 9 tenths and 999 percent percent of the percentage of stuff is fine but we are so affected by the news now <coughs> that it's hard to get away from it unless you literally stop listening to all that stuff and start living your life just like you said well i mean as i said i mean i when it comes to the the racism issue i mean me i've dealt with it my whole life and i've never been a person that's tried other than situation that you know about shared a couple of weeks ago that happened with me in the mall mm -hmm. um that for me was the very first time i ever pu I publicly ever had to speak on something because it wasn't about even a a black issue it was an issue in the fact that that shit is going on and that's been going on for a long period of time and the thing with when, when it comes to the racism situation even when it comes to politicians because you have politicians that will go on the news and they'll say, um, just like you said, we don't have a racism problem in my city, or I don't, I don't, I don't know about a racism problem. And, and the thing is, what, when, when people say that to me, it's usually people, number one, who are of the opposite skin color of me. So you're not going to have that problem because you're not in my situation or people that look like me in my situation. The difference is, is that we can't turn a blind eye to it. It's been going on for decades. It's, it's going to be going on when I'm no longer here. So 
The only thing that we can do right now, and as I said, right now, if this wasn't 2020, where we weren't at home, glued to our phones, glued to our TV, all the things that you're seeing on the media, all the things that you're seeing in your face every day, you'd be oblivious to it because you'd be at work. You'd, you'd be taking care of your families, doing whatever you got to do. So it wouldn't cross the radar on your radar screen as much as it's doing right now. And to me, right now, shining a light on it is not a bad thing because it, people have been blinded by it for so long. Are they, are they doing it in a way that is constructive? No. But on the other hand, as I've said before, sometimes you have to stir a little chaos to bring change. Well, Nothing D, has me, ever happened. Yeah. Let me ask you, you've, you've been around uh, the entertainment industry for so many years, and you have a, 26. Lot of, a lot of friends in all different capacities of the business mm -hmm. that we've been doing for many years. Other yeah. than your experience a couple of weeks ago, which you told me about, um, have you, in general, experienced like a massive amount of feeling of racism against yourself? Or has it um, been a, very small, a small percentage that it's irritating and you can't stand it when it happens? None of this can happen. I've had certain things happen to me as well. But the percentage in comparison to all my friends and all, I know we all love you and we've had, we have a lot of friends in common and mm -hmm. I've never known anybody say anything bad about you ever or even we i don't see your color i don't see any of that shit i don't see any of that but i'm asking is is your experience in your life mm -hmm. really great or is it fortunately a smaller percentage but it still happens sometimes um when i was younger where i grew up where i was um, a lot. It was, it, was, it was heavy. But for me, it's what drove me into the business. It was what drove me to when people said, you know, even in the get-go when they were like... Because you're, you're, you're trained, I think, when you're in this business. Most people, I mean, there's, there's not many people like us, Ron, who dabble in all spectrums. There's only a few that will stay on the... You know, some people just want to be actors and that's all they do. But for me, I was always a person that said, knowledge is power. And I already have a disadvantage against me because of the color of my skin tone. That's just, period. That's just the way it is. But I can use it to my benefit in the sense of I can navigate through this crazy business with my brain. And take the things and the experiences that I've gone through, even with racism growing up, saying, okay, I can use this as a person that, because I, mean, I have friends, for example, who are of my skin color, and they're always like, you know, when they lose a job or they, an opportunity doesn't happen for them, they're like, I didn't get this opportunity because I was black. And I was just like, you know what? When you keep pushing that narrative over and over and over and over and over again, either one or two things happen. Either people look at you as a problem and they view everybody in that race category as that problem or it's you. You, number one, not believing in yourself that you're making this a problem for yourself. So for me, I was like, you know what? I know it's there. I know it's there. And I, and I, I, I grew up with a lot of Italians. You know, they, my friends used to call me black machismo growing up as a kid because I literally was around Italians my whole life. I did business with Italians. I was friends with Italians. I, was, I, I, I even dressed like an Italian at one point growing up as a kid. I had the Indian motorcycle gear and everything else, and I went through my phases. But it was, it was more or less for me saying to myself, okay, I can use this as a way to get in because I had a business partner, and he was black, but he was mixed. And a lot of times when I would come into a business meeting, you get the looks, you get the assumptions, you get, whoa. 
So I said, you know what? I'm going to navigate through this. I'm going to have my business partner who was half black, but he didn't look black. I'd set up the meeting. He'd do all the talking. And that helped me navigate into certain meetings with people that I probably wouldn't have got the opportunity to because, again, there's just that stereotype. But once I was able to, I guess you would say, plant my foot in, I always had a plan. It's, you know, it's, it, it's like a soldier in a mission. You have one directive to complete your mission, to get to the next mission. So for me, it was like, okay, I started off in music. When you hear music, it's the one thing, all of us. You're a musician, I'm a musician. Music, as they always say, is the universal language of love. It resonates with everybody. There's everybody that has a song or a moment in, in time in their life when they hear a song that just hits that spot. It connects us. When something is going on, when you're feeling really, really down, you put music on. When you're feeling really happy, you put music on. So for me, I was like, okay, I'm going to be a musician. I'm going to entertain. I remember the first time I performed in Hawaii in the Hula Bowl game, and we did the Hula Bowl parade, and I was like drumming, and I remember, like it was yesterday, it was 1993, and there was this little kid in the parade route, and he was there with his mother on, on, on her shoulders, and I had to do a drum solo, and, her, and the kid was like, Mommy, Mommy, look. Look at how fast his hands are moving. <laughs> and I stopped, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, I gave a little, you know, little nod to the kid. But it was in that moment, for me, why it affected me so much, because I'm going, you know what? In that moment, it wasn't about my color. It wasn't about it. It was about that this person saw something special that they enjoyed, and I was able to give that gift to somebody for that moment, for that kid to remember. And it what made me say to myself, okay, I want to go to the next level. So it was like I went from music to the club industry. And then I started running nightclubs at an early age. And I did that for like 15 years, creating environments for people to come and de-stress and have a night out, have a, have, a, have a drink, make a love connection. That was my next thing, saying, okay, it's not about black. Because when you're in a nightclub, I've always said a nightclub was like Disneyland. You had different races from different, different organizations of people, black, white, Chinese. Well, what's the thing that connects them again? Music. You go to a nightclub, everybody's listening to music. They don't, they're not caring whether you're black because we're all listening to the same shit and having a good time to de-stress. The 90s for me, as I said, it was a, it was a different time because, again, the racism was there. But for me... Because I was always in a position, just like, for example, when you come into a position as yourself, as a musician, as an actor, as a public figure, suddenly people look at you in a different way compared to someone that is not in our business. Because we put ourselves out there for the world to see. And you have to decide for yourself because you know, dude, this business isn't for everybody. Like, it isn't. You have to have a really tough skin, a tough mental prison to be able to control your thoughts because when the cameras go on, you see that little red light blinking. You transform from Ron Moss to Ridge Forrester. And you try to sort of connect the two. But you're still Ron Moss when that camera goes off. So people grow up when you're in the business, they love Ron Moss. They love D Teflon. But then when the camera's off, is that same love there? And that's where you find in our business the depression aspect of the business. Because we work and we push ourselves to keep working because the biggest battle we have, I think all of us, maybe you can agree to this, all of us have as entertainers is the moment when we're not working, those thoughts, that mental prison that you're in going, okay, well, what's next? What, 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 what's the next chapter for me? Where people, number one, they go to their regular jobs, nine to five. They collect their paycheck every two weeks. 
they cash their check, they do it all over again. For us, there is no, there is no nine to five. Our business is 24 seven. The real work is when you're not working. So for me, it was like the racism stuff that was always there. I was always just saying, okay, I'm dealing with this, but I'm not, I'm so busy. I'm not going to be that guy that focuses on the shit. Of course, I've had some situations. I mean, it's different in the sense of like where what I call the silent racism, where you work in a job and you bust your ass and you kill yourself and you've been there for five, six years. And some person that walks in off the street who you know is nowhere near qualified as you suddenly gets a promotion and you're like, what the fuck? Like, that's where you see the silent. But again, for me, it was always like, okay, I get it. But one day, my whole thing was, is like, you know what? Keep underestimating me. Keep looking at me as the person that's the, the help, the black guy, the whatever. But again, I'm not going to let it stop me because I have see, one mission. To see, keep- let me ask you something. You, yep. I'm curious about this, what you're saying. You're, what you're saying is your, your experience, and I'm very curious about it because for everybody watching D right now, uh, everybody's feeling that you're a real, Tina goes, D is a real survivor. And multiple comments are going, D has such a wonderful positive energy. And you're very thoughtful. I know from years of knowing you how thoughtful mm-hmm. and and considerate. And you're you you have a a huge presence about you. You you're a very articulate. You're very you have an imposing uh, presence when you meet when you meet this gentleman here in person. D, you have this wonderful, wonderful sort of big personality presence, even Thank when you. you don't even speak. You have a wonderful, wonderful energy about you. And I know you've been through a lot of shit. I know you've been through a lot of hell shit, a lot of stuff. <laughs> and that has probably uh, obviously made you who you are, helped make you who you are. But Well, that's the reason when you, when you go back to your first question of where Teflon came from. That is it. That was that was a thing that my one mentor used to say to me is like, you've been through more shit that would have killed people. Literally, I've been stabbed. I've been shot at. I've gone through multiple health situations. But for some reason, this Teflon won't break. And that's when for me, it was like, hmm, I have Alliance Entertainment. And OK, Alliance was me gravitating toward different people from different walks of life, bringing them together. Entertainment is a big word. It's not just music. It's not just television. It's not just film. It's everything. But I'm like, what's my story? And that's when the whole Teflon thing started to grow. And it really grew probably back in the MySpace days when I wrote this blog that literally got over 2.5 million like subscribers. And, and it was called Love is Not Enough. And I was going through a messy divorce situation after it happened and, and um, I needed an outlet and for me writing and, and, and being able number one to release that energy was sort of where for me as a performer, I mean, it's like, it's like, for example, why I'm attracted to the, sh- the series that we're working on right now, which is the Christopher Dorner story, because just like you were talking about with the media earlier, you know, when we're talking about racism, Anyone that doesn't know the Christopher Dorner story, Christopher Dorner was the LAPD officer that went on the 15, the 10 day rampage back in LA in, in uh, 2012. And he killed a couple of police officers, he killed some innocent civilians. But, and again, it was tragic. And it was very, very um, sad what happened to those officers. They were heroes. But all the things that you're seeing right now in the media, in the news, the divide, the police violence, all the shit. If you read Christopher Dorner's manifesto, everything that he said in that manifesto is happening today. And our story 
is going to be very different. It's almost if you guys have watched the OJ Simpson um, with John and Travolta, my buddy John Travolta, who did that series on FX series. We all know the story. We all know what happened with OJ. We all know the verdict. But I've always said when it comes to life, there's three sides to every story. Mine, yours, the truth. And in our story with Dorner, there's only one narrative. There's always been the police side of the story. Not about the person, Dorner, a black man, in the system, who was a person who was a, a war vet, came back and said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm coming here to protect and to serve my community. And he saw an injustice by his superior officer who was training him, who kicked a schizophrenic man by the name of um, Christopher Gettler in the head. And when Dorner reported it to his higher ups, which you're not supposed to do in police code, he eventually had the wrath of God by his blue brothers put on him and they forced him out of the force and he lost everything. And then when he lost everything, he, he snapped. And this is the thing that I tell people. Number one is that like you have two spectrums of the world, all the things that I've gone through. Don't get me wrong. I've had my, my past. I have just like anybody else. I've, I've seen things, I've done things, I've gone through things. And I had to make a decision. My life can either go this way or it can go this way. And coming from the life that I lived, the things that I experienced, you know, I was in a gang at the age of 14 years old. Um, I, I went through a lot of shit in the system, in and out, you know, as a kid. And I eventually had to make a choice. I was like, you know what? I can either take accountability and make the changes necessary to bring a different element where, because you got to understand, us as black men in America, in society, we're seen as three things, Ron. And it's been going on since the beginning of time. We're seen as criminals, athletes, or artists. So you got hip hop rappers, you got basketball players, sports players, and you got criminals that are in the system. And understand that's the narrative that's been pushed out since the beginning of time. You don't see us in a position of executives. I mean, we both have worked through the halls of CBS. And you look at all the networks. There's not one black executive net executive in any of those networks. Not one. And every time that something has been to happen in regards to changing that, you look at all the powerful people. You know, from Michael Jackson, Bill Cosby, Michael Jordan. Anytime that we are put in a position of greatness in the sense of what these people accomplished. They didn't accomplish greatness because they were black. They accomplished greatness because they put in the work every single day to be better, just like Kobe Bryant. He was one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived because he had the discipline and the mindset to say, you know what? I can live my life blending in or I can stand out. So for me, it's like, when people sit there and say to me, okay, well, you're a larger than life personality. I don't really look at it that way. I just, I just be me. I just, I, I, I look at the things that I've gone through and the things that I've experienced. And the only thing I try to do is, is that I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, but I always say to people, number one, everything in life that you do is a choice. It's a choice. You can either choose to be happy. You can choose to be miserable. You can choose to stay in that shitty relationship with somebody or you can choose to get out. You can choose to um, fear a dream, chase a dream, or live a dream. The choice is up to you. So you have to decide for yourself at the end of the day, just like I said with 2020, this shit's going to end. 2020 is going to end. The pandemic is going to end. COVID-19 is going to end. Where do you want to be when this is over? And that why for me, I'm like from, you know, facing near death. And I mean, I've openly spoken about this. I mean, mental health is a real thing. Um, 
I suffer from it. I've been suffering from it for years. And as I said, I mean, when Christoph died, it took a piece of me because four years ago, I was in a really, Rod, I was in a really bad spot mentally. You know, things were, things were great on the outside surface, but inside, all the things that I have gone through, they catch up with you. Because you, yeah. there's only... You know, Let me ask you a question that I yeah. wanted to ask before when I was talking about your, your presence and all. I'm okay. very curious... Mm -hmm. How do people perceive you? I know how you are when we see you and you've got this wonderful presence, as I said before. You've got this wonderful articulate uh, grace and you've got, a, you've got a statuesque sort of presence about you, my friend. And I'm curious, when you talk about the racism that you have personally experienced... In your okay. later life, let's say, now, the last yep. 15, 15 years or so, I'm sure. curious, how, how do, do you think, how do you perceive people looking at you? Now, I, I can't imagine anybody coming up and seeing this wonderful man, D. Teflon, in front of me, especially dressed and elegant the way you were at the memorial we went to and and thinking anything about yeah guys some i don't i don't know like so. <laughs> yeah. no no you know, this like, is this is not uh, this is not the issue i'm sure. i'm talking about a vibe that you project which you are projecting now it has nothing to do with the way you're dressed it mm -hmm. has to do with the way you present yourself and i can't imagine anybody coming up and going I'm going to be, I'm going to uh, inflict some racist attitude against this gentleman, this personality, this man, this person. I don't, I'm, I'm curious how you have experienced this in the last 10, 15 years of how do people, if you've had a bad experience, what do you think happens? Because I don't know anybody who would come up to you and see you that I know and go, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a racist sort of thing against this guy. There's no way you could. You don't project that stuff. I don't project it, but it's still projected on me. I mean, it, it's happened from me going to shopping in a store. Like, for example, you, you know that I'm just like you. I'm heavily in the fashion. I love my suits. So, and they're all usually custom. So when I go into a store, you know, you'll get the... How does that present itself? Sense? And I mean, it, well, it presents itself usually in the sense of like, where I'll get a, 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 an employee that'll say, you know, sir, can I help you? And I'm like, no, I'm good because I, I know what I want when I go into a certain store, department okay. store, what I'm going to buy. Okay. So for me, it's like, it's like if I, if I go into that store, and let's just say, for example, the, the, the item is $700, and I walk over to that area you'll get that employer that will follow me around. Even though I've said I'm good, they'll follow me around to the store and they'll be like, uh, are you sure you need some help? I'm like, no, I'm good. And I, and I already know in their, in their perception what they're thinking. It's like, you can't possibly be able to afford this because they look at someone like me and they think already I should be not in a store of this, this price range. I should Dila, be going over can to I, the... Can I, inter, can I interject something? Yep, yep. Interrupt you? Yep, go ahead. Yep. I went to the complete opposite. I went to... This is obviously somebody who can and is going to afford whatever he wants. So I, as the employee, I want to make sure I'm on this gentleman because I think he's going to buy a shitload of stuff. That's where I would go if I looked at you. Yeah, but you would think that if I walked in there with a suit, if I walked in here dressed like this, which is normally what I do if I go into a, a mall or something like that, I'm not done up in a, in a three-piece suit. I'm going in a casual whatever, and I walk in, but they just make that assumption already of like, okay, well, he can't possibly be able to afford this. 
and I've dealt with this, but I I, I got to give you your opinion and all, but I would look at you dressed just like you are. And I would go, eh, there's something else going on with this guy. He's, he's, but you, that's you, Ron, because you have, I know you've been around. I know that's the difference. Not every, this is the whole thing. People, this is what the problem is. But you don't project that D you don't project any of that shit. You project, I know, I know you I project wonderful sort of stuff. Everybody commenting, going, this guy is just a positive energy. He's got a great energy about him. You don't project that stuff. So anyway, we all have our but own experiences. But, but, but that's the thing. You, you don't have, the whole thing is you don't have to project something for somebody to not, like, okay, the easiest way I can explain it. The biggest problem that we have right now in society, just in general, overall, even when it comes to relationships, is social media. We text each other. We Facebook each other. We comment each other. But nobody actually talks to each other anymore. Like back in the day, we, if you wanted to connect with somebody... In, you have to either do it in person. If I wanted to meet up with Ron, I'd have to meet up with Ron in person. We couldn't be doing what we're doing right now. So a lot of things that I tell people, number one, before you judge somebody, assume something about somebody, talk to the person. Right. So understand, if I walk into a store, we haven't conversed. The first thing they're seeing is just, the, as you say, the presence. So they haven't had a chance to communicate. They don't even give you the opportunity to communicate. They've already made up their assumption in their head. And then when it comes to the fact of me pulling out the money and saying, okay, yes, I can afford this, suddenly you see the person's attitude change. And for me, I don't make a production about it because I'm in a store. I don't, I don't care. I already know what you're thinking. So I, I told you, I let people have that misinterpretation and at the end of the day if you don't talk to me i really don't give a shit because at the end of the day you don't know me if we haven't spoken D, like, can i make a can i make a suggestion way, yep. can i make a recommend uh, not a recommend a suggestion i'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. because i want to see okay. if this plays out the way i think it might play out next time okay. you my friend my dear friend who I love and and mm -hmm. admire your presence and your the way you 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 you're a little heady with everything, like I am, and I have to fight that sometimes. Being <laughs> uh, you're constantly analyzing all the stuff and all. Try, try this, and okay. I want to know what happens the next time you walk into a store and you feel that thing where somebody. You think they're judging you a certain way. Okay. Ask them. Ask them. Go, what, what are you feeling from this right now? Just like blow them away with a little truth moment of what do you okay. I'm looking for some clothes. What do you what do you what are you feeling right now from me doing this? And I'm curious whether they would be honest enough. To go, I was I was thinking you're probably going to buy a lot of stuff, or I I'm just curious what they would say. I'm just curious. They'd probably say nothing, bro. They they probably they'd, they'd probably say the the politically correct thing they would say. They wouldn't say they, the because most you're people most likely they don't right. Say yeah. the truth. They wouldn't. You're they, most, most likely people, right. Most people. It's like for example, when this when this whole situation with George Floyd. I mean, for me, I had friends. Number one, that I've known for years. Now I'm no longer friends with because I saw the racism come out that I didn't even, even think to think that they were racist. Because again, it's just like the media. Just like, it's just like anything. When George Floyd died, this man had a, had a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds until he was dead. Eight minutes and 46 seconds, um, we watched the man get his life taken in, in front of the entire world. And if that doesn't affect you as a human, 
Not about black, not about white, not about Chinese, not about what creed or color you're from. If it doesn't affect you as a human, then there's something seriously wrong with you. And for me, what angered me about that situation with certain people, number one, was that whenever a person of my color either gets in a situation, either confronted by the police or in that situation, the first thing that someone wants to do is dig up somebody's past to say, well, he was a drug dealer back in 15 years ago. And he did this. Or he had a criminal record from this. And, and the question I always say to people is that because you have a criminal record, does that still make you a criminal for your whole life? Because I know people, number one, that have gone through the system. It's like I did when I was younger. And they've turned their life around. Should they have been held with the same brush their whole life when they've made positive changes, they've done positive things for the community, they've done things to make sure that people who are younger in the generation don't make the same mistakes that they do? Should they be crucified for the rest of their life from their past? What makes any person perfect? There is no such thing. So when people constantly use the narrative, well, if he didn't have a criminal past, that wouldn't have happened. Or if he, number one, wasn't here doing this, that wouldn't have happened. Or if he wasn't on drugs, this wouldn't have happened. But it's like we've all known someone who's gone through drug, his, drug, drug situations, drug abuse. And does that make them a bad person? Does that make them an evil person because they've got a drug problem? If they make a, a, a bad decision in life, in their younger, younger days in life, does that make them a bad person for their entire life? No. And this is what happens is that as soon as something happens, people focus on the negative and then again, with not knowing who that person was, period. Like, for example, the same situation, Ron. You're loved and I love you and you're loved by millions of people all around the world. But the same situation that happened to George Floyd could happen to you, could happen to me, could happen to any person here watching this viewing viewership right now. Any one of us can be in a situation that we woke up one day, planned our whole day out, and then something happens and our whole day just goes left. And that's why I tell people number one is that we don't know what someone has gone through. We don't know what anyone's going through. And the world is such in a fucking divide right now because people have forgot the simple aspect of just being kind, of being kind to each other. Because I've always said, like, when you look at 9-11, 9-11 is what, to me, is not what's happening right now. 9-11 is what changed everything for the world. That was the day the world completely went like this. But when you look at what happened in New York after those weeks, after the towers went down, if 9-11 had happened anywhere else in the entire United States, they'd still be digging themselves out right now. Because 9-11 showed it wasn't about black, it wasn't about white, it wasn't about Muslim, it wasn't about jihad, it wasn't about anything. It was about this tragic event that we have to come together to build. We are only as strong as one unit then divided. But people, for some reason, feel that, okay, well, that person's life is more valuable than another person's life. Or when someone sits there and says, like you said earlier on, you're like, I've been around people, number one, and I've never had to experience, number one, racism, people that I've known, or et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. That's great. Well, people will sit there and say, well, it doesn't happen either in my area or in my city, or in my experience, as much. And I always say, forget the as much. It just shouldn't fucking happen, period. We shouldn't even be having the talk about racism. Like Morgan Freeman said, the best way to, to get rid of racism Don't is to stop it. talking about it. 
The best way to get rid of COVID-19 is to stop talking about it. The best way to get rid of the Trumpers versus the non-Trumpers is to fucking stop talking about it. Live your life for you. Make your decisions and live with your decisions and live with your choices. If live you your make life. a choice... Yeah, live your life if, in if a you positive make a, way. Positive way. If you understand, if you make... And I told you, everything in life is a choice, Ron. If you make a bad... Everyone makes mistakes. But I tell people all the time, mistakes are only mistakes once. Anything after that, it's a choice. You can fuck up once, but learn from that shit. I've made mistakes and I've learned from them. And that's why when it came to the situations that I've gone into, I didn't ask for them. I didn't, get, I didn't ask to get beat up by cops when I was a kid. I didn't ask the bottom line you know, to be put in the situations that I've gone through with racism because nobody asked for that. But I'm not going to pretend like it didn't happen. I just don't talk about them. But when I do talk about them, like I did a couple of weeks ago on that video, because it, I couldn't believe like that, like, like seeing what you're seeing on the news. And then for me to go into a store and have somebody berate me like that and feel that they had the power to do so and feel that there was no recourse. Because again, when she played the card, you remember seeing the video where she was like, I'm going to call the police. I was like, call them. I'll wait right here. Do you feel, D, that people respond that way out of fear? Yeah. The fear is a 100%. big motivational fact. And I feel like I feel like fear the is world the is the fear is being perpetuated from my point of view by the media so much, and it's being done on purpose. Because when people are in fear, you can control them a little better. And yep. You can make them think that things are happening when they may not be happening, but you control them with the fear. My friend, we're gonna we gotta wind this up now. This is okay. actually my longest show ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very Hope sad. That, sleep. I'm very sad that Texas uh, uh, fell out of yeah, the conversation happened. here. He was uh, for everybody who just who tuned in late. Uh, Texas was driving about two hours to the airport. He was in Texas and he was driving to another place in Texas to go back to where his uh, house is. And it, you can drive for two hours in Texas and be like in a very small portion of Texas. It's amazing, but he had to drop out of the, uh, drop out of the conversation here, unfortunately. He probably couldn't get back in, but I'm very sad about that. But, D, I want to thank you for everything here. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I miss you guys, man. I, I we miss you, Devin too. I, said hello. I, I hope you're, you're well. She's, uh, she's honest with here. She's been watching the whole thing as well. And everybody, uh, many people have hung with us the whole thing. This has been the, my longest uh, Ron's Garage <laughs> ever. But I thought it was very interesting and very enlightening what you were saying, my friend. And I, I think it's worth everybody hearing and it's your experience of stuff and we we should continue this conversation another love, time I would, I would love to get if you if you want to even see if we can get texas back on even next week because i would love to have him as another black man have this conversation to see number one like what his experiences are because he's in texas and texas is a it's not an easy state to be a black man in you know, D, with, with especially uh, what's D, going on down there. Have, te Texas is black. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't really see that. And that's the whole thing. You're not gonna see it. That's <laughs> why I keep telling people you're you're not gonna see it because you don't carry our same color stone. But I mean, to me, dude, you're my brother. I see you the same way as you see me. I see Texas the same way. I don't see color. I just see people, man. I love everybody. I, D, I love you. I love, I love you. you You're too, a brother. great spirit. And thank you so much for joining me this week. I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Okay, you look man. like you have a beautiful environment there in, in, in Florida. That looks amazing. Yeah, it's, it's a little quiet. It's a little quiet, but it's, it's home. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk. I want to get back to LA. I just want to get back to LA. I just want, I just want to get really? back to LA and start filming. Oh, my God. Dude, I'm dying to go back, be back on a set. I'm, I, I, I've been, luckily, I have other things going on, but. 
right now, man, like I just want to get back to LA and start shooting again, man. Cause it's this, I was good for the first several months, but now it's starting to, it's starting to get, get to, to me. You. Yeah. yeah. I can see that. All right, my friend, I love you so okay, much. Man. Please take love care. You too, keep your, keep your mindset clear. And you, we got, we got to get through this and we're going to get through this. We will. We will. And I hope to see you guys soon. D, thank you so much. Everybody's been really positive with you.